Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Palzinski. I'm coming to you from lovely spring day in New Jersey. And I'm very happy to be here with you all because Van Gogh is not only one of my favorite artists, he's one of the most beloved artists in the canon of all of art history. And many of you know that this is probably the reason that you're here. And it seems so serendipitous that we would be doing this on a day where many of my trees are coming into bloom and many of my spring flowers are coming into bloom, I'm sure yours too, because Van Gogh is known for lots of things, but especially that close view of the beauty of nature as seen through blooming trees, blooming flowers, ever the artist interested in life and how it blossoms. And we see some of this even in his very early years. And so as we go through let's pay particular attention to his birth year. Van Gogh was born in 1853. And the reason that's important to us is that when we look at a work like this dated 1864, we know he's 10, 11 years old. I have 10 year old boys myself. Maybe some of you remember what it's like to be 10 or around 10 year olds and only some 10 year olds have this kind of ability and have this kind of pictorial ability. And we know from a very early age, he was not only precocious in his ability as a draftsman, but also someone who could see things very soulfully. He could look very carefully and in depth to so much of his subjects, including here, a very basic barn and farmhouse. His boyhood is worth noting. He's from an upper middle class family. His mother is from a prosperous family from The Hague. And she pushes a kind of order and set of bourgeois comforts on the boy. His father offers a different kind of set of ingredients. He was a minister of the Dutch Reformed Church. This creates a kind of dualism in here, a kind of set of circumstances that he'll play with throughout his identity construction. He's named Vincent after his paternal grandfather and after a stillborn, born exactly a year before he was. Now, this is worth noting because it's something that we need to come to terms with, being the namesake of a sibling that isn't there. It adds to the kind of psychological complexities that we see in him as a boy. He's serious, he's thoughtful, reclusive, self-conscious, has a kind of suspicious gaze. We know that as he's developing as a child and into boyhood, we see him deal with these parts of his identity in a kind of restlessness. He starts to move here and there. In July 1869, here he is in his late teens, early 20s, his uncle got a job for him in The Hague for a set of art dealers. It's a happy time for him. He's making good money. And from there, he parlays this into a move to London. This is in 1873, moves to an unknown suburb of London to work for an art dealer and stays in Paris along the way. What we can say is in the early years, and you can see the nice list here, he's moving around, he's finding himself, he's restless, he's in The Hague, and then he's in London, first stop in Paris, back to London, back to Paris, and so on. We finally see him around the age of 28 years old, here we are, 1881, we start to see him with his first known paintings. Here we have a, one of a trio of still lives, objects on a table, the kind of quality we'd expect to see in an artist's early work. Not terribly remarkable. This is not something you'd find in history textbooks, but it's worth looking at early work to see where he was, what kind of figure he was during this, let's call it a wandering restless phase from his 
mid twenties to his early thirties, short stays in Belgium and the Netherlands, sometimes alone, sometimes back at his parents' houses in Etten and Noonan in the Netherlands. Here, Van Gogh adopts a kind of traditional, uncomplicated Dutch still life. We see the brown tones. We see the set of objects meant to give us pause, meant to give us a moment of respite as we contemplate not only life's objects and treasures, but what they mean to us in a kind of respite from the world outside. Still lives are in many ways a meditation on life, a meditation more specifically on the brevity of life, hence the title still life. We see this in the Dutch tradition going way back to the Dutch golden age for hundreds of years. And so we see just what we expect to see in Van Gogh's early years, a kind of very Dutch sensibility. And what could be more Dutch than something like this, a beautiful field of flower beds in Holland. The Dutch are very close to the land. Many of you have been to the Netherlands or have seen photos and images of the Netherlands, and you're aware of how hard it was for the Dutch to actually reclaim that land from the oceans through windmills and other engineering feats. And so it brings the Dutch a kind of closeness to the land that in many ways is celebrated through fields of flowers like the ones that you see here. Again, a very typical image for an early artist, especially one coming to terms with her or his kind of work in the Netherlands. Still in his wandering phase, here we find that he is again looking around at the world and instead of paying attention to people and psychologies, he's paying attention to the land and to the kind of quiet solemnity of that land. But with Van Gogh, you always have a kind of hybrid between a spiritual, if you will, connection to the land and then a deep penetrating gaze as he starts to understand the people that are around him. Here he is, 33 years old, a picture that's in the literature considered a bit of a consensus of his early period where he's using deliberately coarse and ugly models in order to suggest a kind of religious connotation, the connotation born out of a Protestant Reformation ethos of humility, a religious picture without religious icons, a kind of return to the basics here. And here we can begin a methodology that we can use throughout our time together today, where we can look at Van Gogh's letters and see in his own writing what kinds of things he said about his work. And I'll just mention that this kind of methodology of looking at an artist's own words is something that reveals quite a bit, but especially with Van Gogh, because his letters are so prolific and he's so excited about sharing different thoughts and ideas that he's had and jotting them all down. Here we are, May 1885. The painting of the potato eaters is very dark. I will tell you why I have done that. While I did that, I thought of what was so rightly said of Mie's peasants. And Mie, you might know as the French Barbizon painter hitting his stride in the middle of the 19th century with beautiful images of peasants that stride in the landscape and give a kind of light to those earning less money than everyone else, the lower socioeconomic classes. Of Mie's peasants, Van Gogh says, his peasants look as if they were painted with the earth they were sowing. And we start to see Mie setting a tradition of focusing on the lower socioeconomic classes, both in industry and of course in the agrarian sector that Van Gogh models. Here at the right, we see an early work in Paris. And as mentioned, he's bouncing around a variety of places in the early years. Now we find him in Paris, he's 33 years old. 
And he's continued work on that darker palette, the browns that you might find in Dutch genre art. Not very much of his time in the late 19th century yet. We find major advances through Impressionism and Post-Impressionism in Paris that he hasn't yet come to know, but he will. And so by point of contrast, before he discovers the exciting world of color in Paris, he's continuing the darker imagery of the Netherlandish palette. On the Paris trip, a number of firsts, including his earliest known self-portrait. A year later, his work evolves considerably towards his signature style. And it's in Paris that his younger brother, Theo, supported him financially and supplied him with materials that he needed to paint. And this is another crucial point of Van Gogh's life and career is, is the love and the camaraderie between these two brothers. Still in his young 30s, still in Paris, mid-March 1886, he's living with Theo on the Rue de Laval, a small second floor apartment, doesn't have much room for an easel. So Van Gogh works at the studio elsewhere on the Boulevard de Cliché. A year later, he's starting to evolve out of the palette of his Dutch years into, we see at the left, a much more Parisian inspired image, much more colorful, much more lively. Van Gogh, ever the observer of what's around him, is now observing what's in Paris. And this would make sense that he would do this. At this moment, certainly by the 1880s, Paris is an epicenter of the avant-garde world of art. That is the forward thinking kind of art. Not the only epicenter of art in Europe or elsewhere, but for Impressionism, very much the center of it all. And we start to see in this pairing of images, Van Gogh creating imagery of not only the new architecture of Paris, born under a urban renewal project known as Hausmanization, but also at the right, a kind of coming to terms with the artistic community there, the thriving community of Bohemians in places like Montparnasse and Montmartre, people like Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, the author of the portrait at the right of Van Gogh. He's becoming a cafe artist. He's very much part of the cafe concert lifestyle of that time. You might know Toulouse-Lautrec here, one of his most famous his iconic image at the left, Divan Japonaise. And it's one of those views inside the world of Paris at that time. Lautrec loved that world, the world of oddities, the world of bohemianism, the world of the avant-garde celebrated at that time throughout the city, in part because Lautrec had a childhood injury that left him with a kind of lifelong set of disabilities. He was misfitted in an aristocratic world into which he was born and celebrated on the margins of Parisian society. We find in Lautrec's work a kind of celebration of performance, of spectacle, of theater, of costumes, of eroticism, all things that Van Gogh was now newly exposed to. And it would be this set of circumstances that becomes a major catalyst for his work and a major springboard into some of his great Parisian work. Still in his young 30s, 34 years old, in Paris, he paints the first of two series of his iconic Sunflower series. Always much better appreciated up close, mind you. So, what we're doing here today is looking at simulations of these paintings, it gets us some of the way. And in many works of art, it gets us even further along. But with Van Gogh, there's a textural quality to the paintings, a kind of, if you will, 3D sculptural quality, where imagine running your hand on the surface of the canvas, don't do this, of course, but imagine doing that. And it's a kind of texture, a kind of 
bohemianism in paint, a kind of celebration of not only what the image looks like, but what it might feel like, what it feels like from a tactile perspective. The first set of the sunflower shows the flowers lying on the ground, as we see in these two images, or on a flat surface. In the second set, he'll do a year later in Arl, we start to see sunflowers in lovely bouquets and vases. This is Van Gogh looking very carefully at nature and then understanding the reality of cutting flowers and removing them from their life source and how quickly they wither and die and how poetic that is because we're all like those flowers. We have a limited amount of time. And Van Gogh is starting to see flowers as a stand-in, as a metaphor for his own time here, a kind of Parisian version of the Dutch still life that he had worked with previously. It's in Paris that Van Gogh comes under the spell of a major overarching theme that in art history is called Japanese. I'll tell you that I've given an eight hour lecture series on Japanese, so there's lots and lots to be said about this. But for our purposes, we don't need eight hours. We just need the backdrop of a kind of craze for all things Japanese that washes over Paris and washes over Europe. There are reasons for this, of course and we'll touch on some of those in just a moment. One thing to be said is that there have been Japanese objects and works of art in Europe previously. It's not that Japanese art is suddenly brand new on the scene. It's just that it hasn't been seen in a long time. And now with the opening of Japan, we see works like the one at the right by the great hero Shigi in different venues in Paris, in department stores, in galleries. And this kind of work is brand new to most of the artists working in Paris. And so, like so many of his contemporaries, Van Gogh does his own version of these Japanese prints under the bigger heading of Japanese. But here, his flowering plum tree after Hiroshigi. We wouldn't see this as cheating or as a kind of bricolage or appropriation, you would see this as a kind of step that an artist would take to come to terms with a brand new kind of influence. Think of what it would be like to see Japanese prints like this if you've never seen anything like them. You would suddenly do your best to try to incorporate some of the techniques that you'd find in Japanese art like layering imagery in flattened tones. Whereas the European Renaissance tradition taught artists to layer imagery in a kind of modeling of light and shade, a kind of chiaroscuro, a kind of perspective. Now we have a hybrid of Japanese influences mixed with European influences. Very quickly, why is this? What, what's happening that allows for the sudden influx of Japanese art in Paris and elsewhere. The long story short is that the figure that you see here, Matthew Perry, as Commodore of the American Navy, led the breaking into Japan. He literally ordered his ships to steam past Japanese enemy lines. Japan was closed for hundreds of years under a very strict set of rules that only allowed certain traders in to the port of Nagasaki and only allowed certain objects in and certain objects out. But suddenly, under Matthew Perry spearheading a set of diplomatic concerns, we have a militarized opening of Japan, which led to the American Treaty the Convention of Kanagawa, the Japan and US Treaty of Peace and Amity. It was signed under threat of force and ended Japan's iso isolationist period. And of course, it precipitated the signing of treaties with other nations, including the Treaty of Amity and Commerce between France and Japan. 
Japan was forced to apply to other nations the conditions granted under the American Japanese Treaty. And so, what this meant for not only American interests abroad, but for French interests, remember Van Gogh is working in France, it meant exchange of diplomatic agents and opening of Japanese ports for foreign trade, places like Edo and Kobe and Nagasaki and Yokohama, fixed low import export duties, things like this. And once that cat was out of the bag, you had people like the powerful businessman from Satsuma, the son of a samurai, Tomo Atsu, who himself negotiated the establishment of the French Satsuma Trading Company. And he worked with the Frenchman Charles Montblanc to do so. You, you might know that French name, Montblanc. He later becomes the first diplomat credited by the emperor of Japan. And all of this clout meant that Tomo Atsu uses his political power to have his own separate pavilion at the Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1867. Why is this important to the story? Because 15 million visitors from 42 countries visited that exposition that year in Paris, including Jules Verne, inspired him to write 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And at this exposition, under the Japanese Art Expo, we find 100 prints displayed meaning a massive impact of Japanese art seen by virtually no one up to that point on artists, on collectors, on merchants, on learned societies and travel books and department stores. Suddenly everyone in Paris is seeing a new kind of art and Van Gogh is in line too to incorporate all this under the heading of Japanese. So naturally, we would expect to see that development in his work. Even when he moves out of Paris, February 1888, he moves to Arles and brings with him from Paris an interest in Japanese. You might say here, Japanese meets Arles. It's on the softer side of the palette, but leaning into the richness, the saturation, of color, greens are getting greener, blues are getting more imaginative, more whimsical. Imagery doesn't look, if you will, photographic. Imagery is looking more abstracted and the journey of modernism goes that way, that throughout the 19th century into the 20th century, artists will step by step, inch by inch, move away from faithfully recreating an image out in nature and instead incorporate something of themselves, something in Van Gogh's case, idiosyncratic, something symbolic, something sometimes emotional. The goal then is not to document the world as it is, but to incorporate yourself, your own experiences into the scene as laid out in front of you. So with Something like the bridge, we've got a subject right out of Japanese mud, right out of Japanese gardens and Japanese bridge making. But that subject transposed over the impressionist love for color, the impressionist love for sketchy and dotted brushwork mixed with Van Gogh's desire to put himself into his scene to create a kind of emotional resonance. And again, that requires a page from his own playbook, a page from his own letters. 1888, he writes, the countryside here seems to me to be as beautiful as Japan in terms of the limpidity of the atmosphere and the brightness of the colors. Water makes patches of fine emerald green and rich blue in the landscape, such as we see in Japanese prints. Now, Van Gogh doesn't go to Japan. He doesn't know anything about this firsthand. But now with the influx of Japanese and images out of Japan, as never before, in Paris and a stone's throw in the pond working its way outward, 
we find artists like Van Gogh coming to terms with this, making a kind of nod to what they suspect Japanese art is all about. By April, he's starting to approach his peak, playing with imagery more, distancing his objects more from reality, animating trees and nature in a kind of collective dance. It's downright jubilant, shouts spring and renewal, a kind of close look at nature and the world around him. By summer of that year, August 1888, he begins the second series of Sunflowers, one year after the first series. And as we've seen before, it's a kind of tragic beauty, pulling something from its life source, separating it onto a table for study. And it's for this reason that we see the close-up view at the right, really looking closely into not only the petals of the flowers, but the kind of life source of that and letting the background dissolve, letting all of this disappear as he focuses on pure blocks of color and all attention paid to the vase of flowers. And he applies this kind of look at nature into bigger atmospheric scenes like the ones that you see here. Now we're into late summer and into fall, still in Arl, about 35 years old, kind of nighttime imagery, outdoors, mixing of nature and figuration, but never a painter of humanity as the first ingredient. Here we find people populating a scene, but truly as stand-ins. These are images of nature, the power of nature. You might say in a Kantian sense or in a Burkean sense, a kind of sublimity of nature, the power of nature in an awesome spiritual way. Again, Van Gogh focuses on nature as it dots the sky just above one of his iconic images here, the cafe terraces at night in Arl a kind of transition from outside to inside, a transition from nature to architecture. And it's here where Van Gogh gets very serious about explaining in his letters what he's doing. He writes in August, today I'm probably going to start work on the interior of the cafe where I'm lodging in the evening by the gaslight. It's what's known here as a night cafe, they're quite common in these parts, one that stays open all night. Night prowlers, he says, can take refuge here when they don't have the money to pay for lodgings or are too drunk to be allowed in. So we know where he's headed. We know the kind of lifestyle he lives in. We know the kind of people he's coming into contact with. And we know that he's starting to question behaviors of people, people, many of whom are lost to the world, many of whom are on the fringes of society, like he believes himself to be as a kind of avant-garde artist, always misunderstood for what he's doing and perhaps how he was behaving. He continues in the letter, all these things, family, homeland, are perhaps more attractive in the imaginations of people like us, he means the outsiders who manage reasonably well without a homeland or a family than they are in any reality. I always feel like a traveler, he says, going somewhere towards some destination. If I sense that this somewhere, this destination doesn't in fact exist, that seems to me quite reasonable and very likely true. So in the letters, we find a, an analog to everything he's doing in the paintings. And here, a view inside of one of those night cafes and yet another iconic image that's telling us how he's observing people, what kind of lifestyle he has. He writes, I've tried to express the terrible passions of humanity with reds and greens, 
The room is blood red and dull yellow with a green billiard table in the middle. There are four yellow lamps casting an orange and green glow. Everywhere, he writes, there's a struggle and a clash between the very different greens and reds. In the small figures of the sleeping good-for-nothings, in the sad and empty room and violet and blue, the blood red and the green yellow of the billiard table, for example, contrast with the delicate little Louis XV green of the counter with its bunch of pink flowers. And one last part of this letter is amazingly revealing. In my picture of the night cafe, he writes, I've tried to convey the sense that the cafe is a place where one goes to ruin, goes mad, commits crimes. I've tried to express the powers of darkness in a way in this dive of a bar through contrast, delicate pink, blood red, wine red, and soft greens and Veronese green, in contrast with hard green yellows and blue greens, all this amid an infernal furnace of pale sulfur. Take a look around this picture, the floor tips, the billiard table tips, the figure stares out at us wondering who we are, what we're doing, as he notes about color theory and the perception of color, greens and reds create a disharmony, a discordant rhyme. The lights are very bright. And all of this for him through color is a way to render emotionally what he's feeling. And this is a nice moment to talk about what he's feeling because with his relationship with the equally famous painter, Paul Gauguin, we get a sense of Van Gogh's interiority. They met in late 1887. Gauguin had just returned from Martinique. They exchanged paintings. His brother Theo exhibited Gauguin's work in his Montmartre gallery. And in October of that year, 1887, Gauguin arrives in Arles upon Van Gogh's invitation. Van Gogh went to Arles hoping to establish an artist community at his house. Gauguin was the only artist he invited who actually came. Gauguin was wary about going and not happy about being stuck in what he considered to be a provincial town. And Theo pushed this as Van Gogh insisted. Gauguin was ultimately beholden to Theo for the sale of his work. And so we see a kind of reluctance between the two at the very beginning of the friendship here, Paul Gauguin in one of his great pictures, The Yellow Christ, which gives you a sense that he, like Van Gogh, is thinking outside the box, rendering imagery, not as if we would expect to find in the real world, but a world where color can do all kinds of exciting things. For Van Gogh, color as we see in the night cafe and the other images, behaves emotionally. It, it creates a mood that Van Gogh wants us to feel. He wants us to feel what he felt. With Gauguin, we don't have color creating a mood as much. We have a kind of symbolism of color, a kind of yellow stands for something symbolically or red stands for something symbolically. But Above all of this in Gauguin's sense is how nature becomes the key ingredient. Above man, he writes, is nature. Yet what richness of means to attain an intimate relationship with nature, he writes. Yet you have fewer means than nature. Will you ever have as much light as nature, as much heat as the sun? And you speak of exaggeration, but how can you exaggerate since you remain below nature? And for Gauguin, we see how he puts all of this love of nature, just like Van Gogh had, into his paintings here. One of the most important paintings in the Gauguin oeuvre, a painting after his trip in 1891 to Tahiti. Here, Gauguin asks some of the big questions of life. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? This is a moment for Gauguin where in 1903, shortly after the painting, he's sentenced to three months in prison and fined 500 francs and 
few months later dies in 1903. That's the way Gauguin's story went on after his relationship with Van Gogh. But there's more to the story. We find in the comparison of the two portraits at the left, a portrait Van Gogh makes for Gauguin and at the right, a portrait obviously after Van Gogh has injured himself, the classic narrative of Van Gogh's injury to his ear, December 23rd. We know there's a confrontation between Gauguin and Van Gogh. Van Gogh calls it an attack. He had been drinking absinthe and understood that he had a diagnosis of syphilis, had rotting teeth. There's a lot happening here in Van Gogh's physical and mental health, a deterioration. In the middle of this, Gauguin tells Van Gogh that he's leaving and they argue. Later in the evening, Van Gogh brought a package with part of his severed ear in it and meant to give it to Gauguin, brings it to where Gauguin was staying and asks the hostess to give it to Gauguin with the message, remember me. The next morning, he woke up in a pool of blood, almost unconscious and taken to the hospital. And he stays in that hospital in Arles, December, 1888, and again in January, 1889. And even in this circumstance, Gauguin is using his powers of observation, using his emotional connection to people to understand the world around him. 36 years old, May 1889, he admits himself to the asylum of Saint-Paul de Mazol near Saint-Rémy in Provence. Theo arranged for two small rooms adjoining cells with barred windows. The second was to be used as a studio. And it's at Saint-Rémy where he created almost 130 paintings, extremely prolific. Here in the irises, a painting he began the first week working from nature in the asylum's garden. The cropped composition inspired by the decorative patterning of Japanese woodblock prints. Imagine seeing flowers up closely like this, kneeling down in the ground, getting nose to nose with what's there, a kind of behavior that would have been considered eccentric in that day, but for Van Gogh, a kind of communion with the transcendental properties of nature. In Saint-Rémy, he paints the starry night, an image dominated by the bright moon at the right and Venus at the center left, a painting about mood and expression and symbology inspired by his view from the window at the asylum. The vision of this image took place at night, and yet the painting among hundreds of artworks Van Gogh made that year was created in several sessions during the day. And we can glean from this that he is thinking very consciously, very clearly about the imagery that he's making. He's not just creating this in a wild frenzy. He's taking his time, he's slowing down, and he's looking at his own connection of nature outside the window, if you will. More cypresses, like the one we see in Starry Night, painted in late June, just after Starry Night. Take a look at that sky here, a kind of movement of nature, the kind of pleasure of nature, the kind of cosmic symbology that you would expect Van Gogh to be experiencing at this point. He's isolated himself away from the rest of society. He's taking that time to do what he's always done, to look at nature very closely, to be in nature as a kind of respite from the daunting realities of the pressures of conformity. Here, the famous portrait of Dr. Gachet I've done a portrait of Dr. Gachet with a melancholic expression that may well seem like a grimace to those who may look at that. And yet that's what should be painted because 
By comparing this with the calmness of old portraits, he writes, one realizes how much expression and passion there is in the faces of today. Like a kind of expectation or a certain vintage quality, sad yet gentle, but clear and intelligent. That's how many, that's how portraits ought to be painted, he writes. This isn't just a depiction of someone who's trying to help him get back to wellness. This is an image that is at once about Van Gogh's own evolving artistry and the subject depicted here, about Van Gogh's interest in looking at people for their psychologies, for their internal dialogues, as it is about color and composition and how things are rendered. Here we find Van Gogh's move to auvers sur -Oise. He's there from May to July, 1890. He's 37 years old. His life is moving quickly. He's painting quickly. And we see this combination of faceless figures in nature. Again, figures that are stand-ins to give a sense of scale in the composition, but also as a kind of way to transpose himself in the image as a way for us viewers to have a place to access the image. We see viewers and we occupy their place in the image. Take a look at how these figures operate in these landscapes, faceless figures, same distance in both from the viewer, from him to us, a kind of safe distance that Van Gogh prefers. We'll see many decades later, Mark Rothko, a New York-based painter at the height of the New York school in the middle of the 20th century, a kind of pinnacle for modernism, adopt a quality like this to understand people and their behaviors through a kind of faceless image as they're lost in the crowd, or in Van Gogh's case, lost in nature. At the right, an image of figures that are closer to him than we see at the left, but figures that seem to freeze as they pass, a kind of awkwardness of their not looking his or our way, even though we're so close. An image in every way, very much about how he sees himself in relation to other people. He's looking at nature, that's what he's there to do. And as these figures pass by, they take him out of that groove and we get a sense of them being a bit like an interruption with his communication to nature. At some point in July, he paints a muted scene like this, no figures, the vista, anticipates his more profound wheat field pictures that would follow. And we see references to his mood very much toward the end of his life now in the writings. In July, he writes, as vast as a sea, delicate yellow, delicate soft green, the delicate purple of a turned over and weeded piece of ground, speckled regularly with the green of flowering potato plants all this under a sky of delicate blue, white, pink, and violet hues. His focus is on the beauty of the color of nature. Look at where he's positioned himself at a safe distance to offer a lovely vista from above. Another of these muted late scenes, I am altogether in a mood of almost too great composure in a mood to paint this. In a way, Part of him is looking up. In a way, psychologically speaking, he's exploring one part of his identity that is very much at peace in nature. But as you know, perhaps in the story, unfortunately, there's a dark turn at the end. There are frequent breakdowns in the later years. The consensus in the literature is that he had temporal lobe epilepsy that caused likely all kinds of conditions, residual effects of general illness, effects from syphilis. July 27, 1890, he's 37 years old, and he's shot in the chest with a revolver. 
there are no witnesses, and walked back to town. He's attended by two doctors who couldn't remove the bullet. Theo rushed to his side in good spirits. He died 30 hours later. His last words, the sadness will last forever. In the biography by Nypha and Smith, there's a new theory proposed. They argue that Van Gogh didn't shoot himself, but was shot by the 16-year-old René Sacretin, a summer visitor who taunted him. Remember, Van Gogh would have been seen as an eccentric and probably had all kinds of other visible health defects. There is in the Nypha and Smith argument that Van Gogh protects the young René by claiming that his wound was self-inflicted. He figured he would die anyway, perhaps wanted to at this point. He welcomed death. Dr. Gachet and Theo believed it was suicide. But there's a bit more to the story. As mentioned, the health is generally neglected. He didn't eat properly. He drank in excess. And pictures like this, the wheat field crows, point to all of that, a kind of darkness psychologically that he's feeling. He writes, I myself have been completely absorbed by that endless plain with fields of wheat against the hills. This letter was an unfinished draft. It was found on Van Gogh's body when he died, July 27th, 1890. And let's close with this a kind of inward look, a kind of door to where he was, using a Van Gogh trick back on himself. He looked so closely at things around him from the precocious, beautiful drawings at age 10, through the potato eaters, through the early Parisian works, through all these wonderful and complex moments of nature. Now we can turn that lens back on him. And to be honest, he writes, It's only through our pictures that we can speak. And yet, dear brother, there's still what I've always told you. And I'll say it once again, with all the seriousness that the efforts of a mind diligently set on seeking to do as well as it possibly can, is capable of expressing. I tell you again, he writes, that I shall always consider you to be other than a mere dealer in Corot's, Corot the great French painter. That through me, you have your part to play in the actual production of certain canvases, which even in the midst of this disaster, retain their calm. For that's where we are, he writes, and that is all or at least the main thing I have to tell you at this moment of reflective crisis, at a moment when things are very fraught among those dealing in pictures by artists both living and dead. As for my own work, he writes at the end, I risk my life for it and my sanity is half shot away because of it, fine. But you're not one of those dealers in men as far as I know, and you can choose the side you're on, it seems to me, and act with genuine humanity, but what's to be done? Profound ending to a profound life. I encourage you to Think about the great gifts of Van Gogh and the kind of imagery he left as a result of those gifts and what it might mean to you and how you view imagery like this. I'll see you soon. 